I'm Mark Kepler, Purdue University Extension Educator here in Fulton County, and I have brought with me today a guest, and that's Eric Bittinger. And Eric works for the DNR, and there's a lot of phases of the DNR, but what we're going to get into today and in talking about is the major thing that Eric does, and that is get himself involved with the plants, the insects, and all those bad guys that may be reaching us into the state today. So Eric, explain a little bit about your job position with the Department of Natural Resources. I work for the Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. We're one of the smallest divisions in the DNR. And our job, our role, we really have four different sections that we go into. The first is nursery inspection. So we're looking at, uh, is the plant material saleable? Does it have any diseases or issues that homeowners do not want? The second part of our job is dealing with invasive species like what you were talking about. The third area is uh, foreign imports and exports. Mm -hmm. We do some work with the USDA on that. And then finally, we have an apiary specialist or a beekeeper who helps uh, the beekeepers in the state of Indiana with certification and with uh, moving hives across state lines. Okay, let's go back to the first part you talked about, that nursery inspection. Mm -hmm. Um, we think of a nursery, we think of a place that they are growing plants. The reality is you inspect a lot of things other than the place they're growing plants, but it's the place they sell perennial plants. And I think that's the definition lots of times of what you go into with your nursery inspections. So talk about the kind of places you would inspect in that. By definition, we regulate what are called uh, what we call nursery stock, and that in the law is defined as hardy perennials, okay. basically speaking. Uh, so anybody who sells or solicits the sale of nursery stock or hardy perennials has to have a license in the state of Indiana. On top of that, if you're growing plants out, growing meaning if you are propagating mm -hmm. or growing them out for size, you have to have an additional license, which is a grower's license. So we work on both dealers and growers and uh, do inspections. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is to get the, uh, the nurseries to understand when I show up, I'm not there to shut them down. I'm there to try and keep them in business. Uh, we're there to help them out as much as we can, uh, but we do have to enforce the rules of the state of Indiana. So part of the job is, is really consumer protection in that situation. Absolutely, that is the biggest chunk of what we do. And what you're really doing in that job is making sure they're certain insects, certain diseases aren't there. Um, and, and so you look at the bugs and you look at the diseases that might be there. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else you're looking for specifically in that process? Uh, insects and diseases are the primary okay. things we're looking for. Occasionally, based on expertise of the inspector, you may notice something in the nursery and just make a, a comment to the owner that says, you know, you, you might really be helped out if you do this or that, or uh, in many of the cases, it's simply, um, you know, you have this particular plant or this particular item, this is for illegal for sale in the state okay. of Indiana. Um, or, you know, I was at a nursery just yesterday and I spotted a pest problem they're probably not even aware of was there. Okay. And so, with given that I'm looking for them all the time, sometimes a, a different set of eyes, a fresh set of eyes going through a nursery, uh, sometimes we spot problems the nurseries aren't even aware of are there. So, so. it's good to it's good to have that. Um, how many counties do you cover? I cover eight counties. Eight counties. And so you get around to these nurseries once a year, twice a year? About once a year okay. for, for most of the nurseries. Okay. So that's one part of your job. There's another part that I, I talk about a lot, and that's these things called invasive species. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to start off with a story. I've been in Extension now for 34 years, and I started it out in Lake County. And when I started out in Lake County, this invasive moth called the gypsy moth was coming in, bearing down on Lake County. And I would have said at that time, 34 years ago, in the next five years, it's going to be here and it's going to start doing some damage. And this, it gets on oak trees and a, a variety of different trees to do the damage. They haven't got there yet. 
and they haven't got there because of the efforts of the Department of Natural Resources in Indiana. It's in Michigan, it's in Ohio, but you guys have, I think it's one of your greatest success stories. And talk about a little bit what happens and what happens with gypsy moth. Gypsy moth actually is in Lake County. Uh, there are a couple of sites that we have treated over the years, but it's not the disaster that I think a lot of people were expecting as this, uh, this particular moth moved through. The gypsy moth program is called Slow the Spread, or STS. It's a cooperative between the U.S. Forest Service and the states that are on the front line of gypsy moth. And gypsy moth is like, um, like an old friend to me. I've, I've worked with it as long as I've been with the DNR. In fact, gypsy moth is part of the reason I work for the mm -hmm. DNR. Uh, kind of a long story there. But um, the success comes from the fact, a, a couple of factors. Number one, there was a willingness to put together a group of states and a group of cooperators across many states to work on, the sa on a single issue. The second part of it is, is that there was the willingness to put the money down to do the research to figure out this insect. Mm -hmm. And then the third part of it is the biology of the insect. There's actually something we can do. Yeah. In many cases with invasive species, there's just not much. Mm -hmm. there's, they're very difficult to control. But gypsy moth was one that we were very fortunate to figure out. Uh, the introduction was made into Boston in the late 1800s, about 1870, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly. And uh, they've been fighting this, this thing ever since. Uh, but as far as our movement goes, if we would just let Gypsy Moth go, uh, it would be yeah. all the way to southern Indiana within a matter of a decade or two. So, Gypsy Moth, like you say, is in Lake County. It is in Fulton County. Yes, it is. It is around. Mm -hmm. But you guys, because of this unique biology that you're talking about, mm -hmm. have got some neat approaches uh, 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 of trying to, con or of controlling them uh, that works out really, really, really well yes. for these different ones. And so, yeah, you kind of brought along a little example. This is the first line, if I may think of, of Gypsy Moth. This is a pheromone trap. You see these on... Well, what's a pheromone? Pheromones are the scents that the insect put out. The gypsy moth is kind of unique. What we are dealing with here in Indiana is called the European gypsy moth. Now, there's an Asiatic gypsy moth okay. as well. But the European gypsy moth is unique because the females do not fly. So the males have to find the females. So they put out... The females put out a pheromone or a scent to attract the males in. Okay. So what we do is we put these boxes out, and these boxes are uh, have a lure in them, a scent in them, that replicates the female's mating pheromone. You're tricking those boys, aren't you? So we get the males to fly into the trap. So these are typically used as monitoring traps. Uh, there's a second type of this trap, which is a, what we call a delta which is a, a cardboard triangle that's sticky on the inside. And they're purple, if I remember right, this year. Uh, they're actually green this green year. Green they are uh, this They've year. been green, they've been tan, they've been purple, but they're green but this year. But you do year. find them all up and down the roads of various parts yes. of the county. Uh, the one thing that I do ask is if you see those traps, leave them alone. Okay. Uh, because they are part of a monitoring system, and if those traps go up missing or are disturbed in some way, they, it does affect our, our counts okay. and our traps. So what happens is all these counts go into a uh, computer program and they get gridded out on a map. And then I can look at these traps and try and locate where the high points are and that is the locations that I need to start hitting the ground and start looking for egg masses. Uh, these traps can be somewhat effective in, in controlling small populations yeah. or small pockets, but they're actually much more effective as a monitoring tool in just showing us where we need to be working. Okay, so they show up. I've got some here, uh, say several mm -hmm. of these traps in an area, uh, show up with some of uh, these male gypsy moths. Mm -hmm. So then what happens? That winter I'm going to hit the ground okay. and we're going to start walking and we're going to start looking at trees and what we're looking for is the egg masses. We're going to wait until the fall. Typically when the leaves are off the trees is the best time to um, best time to go out and look for these things. This is actually on the back side of a hickory bark 
Um, so sometimes you have to really look. Yeah. Uh, if you walk up to the tree, you will have seen nothing, but starting to pull back the, the um, shedding bark on a shag bark hickory, I found about 40 some egg masses on that okay. particular tree. So, um, so with the green box, you think they're here. With this, you confirm they're here. Yes, and sometimes we can't. Yeah. Now, the, the traps are enough to confirm that they're in the area, but it's really nice to have a specific area because sometimes uh, I had a case in Warsaw where we had a nine trap at one end of the road, a 12 trap at the other end. If they put the trap in the middle, yeah. halfway down the block, it probably would have been a 200 trap okay. uh, because the population was there in the middle and it was picking up the fringes out on either trap. Uh, but in this particular case, it's a lot of walking, a lot of hunting. And gypsy moth, they love to be upside down when they lay their egg masses. They love to be up under things in shelters. So it really means hunting and looking. One of the biggest ways that a gypsy moth population has spread is on camper trailers because they get underneath the wheel wells. They lay mm -hmm. egg masses underneath those wheel yep. wells on there. So you went to a state park or some park somewhere in Michigan that has gypsy moths and they can end up laying those eggs right underneath there and, and they, they will travel. They do. Picnic tables, tricycles, trash cans, uh, outdoor furniture, uh, housing siding, um, cars, trailers, boats. I've seen them on just about anything Yeah, uh, that happens to be a either stored underneath a tree or around trees that particularly white oaks where the gypsy moths seem to do the best. And they prefer to eat oak trees for the most part. They've got a wide variety of things they eat. About 300 species yeah. that they will feed so, on. So it's really kind of interesting. This is a kind of a general feeder in that respect. It is. Whereas we've got other things we'll talk about later on that are very specific mm -hmm. that we'll get into. So you found them, you know the egg masses are there. What's the next step that next year then? Uh, we might do, depending on the uh, on the find, we might do several different things. Um, there are certain locations where we'll do nothing. And these are typically in our northern counties, St. Joe Elkhart counties, uh, maybe into northern Marshall County. And the reason for doing nothing is that we're behind what we call the five moth line or the ten moth line. And those lines are kind of an artificial line that we draw. They're right about U.S. 30 right now. Okay. And based on that decision we know that there are predators up in that area we know that the area is considered what we call generally infested so we may not waste our resources back there if you think of it like a fire line there's no use treating the back side of the fire yeah. and that's what that particular location would be now if we find something in the further south we go and the further away from that 10 moth line we go the higher the priority becomes. Fulton County being one of those. Uh, actually, we had a find in Lafayette, mm. which was a very high, and we actually went into eradication in that particular case. Interestingly, they found the egg mass, or found the caterpillars, on a tree outside the loading dock of one of the dorms at Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, connect the dots. How yeah. did those get Traveled there? Traveled in. Yep. And uh, a grad student at Purdue actually found them. Yeah. But... In that particular case, we'll be even more aggressive than we are in Fulton County. Now, based on what we find, we may come in and do ground treatments if it's on an isolated tree. And we have a number of different tools, a number of different products that we could use there. Or we may come in with an aircraft if the area is big enough. And the aircraft treatments can either be a mating disruption where we use more of that female pheromone, cover the entire area with the pheromone, and make it very difficult for the males and females to find each other. Or the other treatment that we may use is called BTK or Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki, which is a great product. Um, it's an organic product mm -hmm. that has been used on caterpillars in vegetable industries okay. for a naturally yeah. occurring bacteria. It is. It's yeah. a soil it's not, bacteria. It's not a chemical insecticide. It's a naturally occurring bacteria. Yes. But the other part is the part that gets really interesting to me is when you talk about uh, the d mating disruption part. Yes. And last I knew, you used to f drop flakes is, uh, of, of the insecticide. Is that still true? Gypsy moth is on the cutting edge of being environmentally friendly okay. and that's when you look at the products if you go back a hundred years they were treating with this really 
powerful product called arsenic. Yeah, lead arsenic too. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, so there's a lot of hazard in that. And the, one of the concerns with the fl plastic chips was you're yeah. putting plastic out in the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, now we've actually evolved into a product called Splat. It's a lovely name. It's a wax carrier oh. that um, that they can put whatever yeah. pheromone that they want. In this case, we use what's called Splat GM, Splat Gypsy Moth. So the female sets right there. The male can only travel. You drop these flakes, if I might use splat down into that mm -hmm. case. And he flies over and finds out that this is not a female and flies in there and finds out this one's not a female. And then he just gives up. We also take advantage of the fact the males hatch out from their pupil cases yeah. about two days before the females. Okay. So they hatch out and immediately start finding, looking for a female instead of resting. And uh, yeah, they basically wear themselves out looking for a female that isn't there. And that's the end of that. So that's, that's the gypsy moth. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's a really good example of how the DNR has succeeded. Now I'll use another example, and that is the emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. And in the case of the emerald ash borer, you tried. Uh, at least they did up in Michigan where it first came in at. They tried, but because of the biology of that insect, it just wasn't easy to do. And also, I think people had a lot to do with that also. You're correct. Uh, emerald ash borer was particularly difficult. Now, unlike gypsy moth, where I can go up and I can find an egg mass, emerald ash borer spends most of its life cycle under the bark of the tree. And... The problem there is you can often come up to a tree, an ash tree in particular, uh, which is uh, ash is 99.9% .9 of this insect's diet. Mm -hmm. The one other tree is white fringe tree, which is a very rare feed. It's actually a very rare find up in this in northern Indiana. So unlike the gypsy moth that takes on 300 different trees, this guy likes ash, and that is pretty much it. Yes, green ash, white ash, blue ash, pumpkin ash, yeah. all the ashes. Um, mountain ash, which is important to note, is not an ash. Not an ash. So mountain ash is actually fine. Yeah, mountain ash is actually closer relative to the crab apple. But anyway, the um, the difficulty with emerald ash borer is you typically can't find the insect until it's already killing the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we found with this particular insect is every time we found it, we keep moving out further. And it was typically as much as one to two years out ahead of us. Um, so the insect had spread out further than we were looking at any given time. And that was true by the time they had... Um, uh, identified it in Michigan, it already had about a 10-year head start. Mm -hmm. And it was just a very difficult insect to deal with. And people also came into this. Plant. And it, exactly. Uh, many of the finds that we had in Indiana, especially some of the first finds, were in campgrounds and lumber yards. And these are places where firewood or logs are moved. Uh, sometimes they're left to sit for a while. Um, Many times I would find a, a campground with dead ash trees, and it, you wouldn't have to go very far to find campers with Michigan license plates. So somebody lost a tree up in Michigan, and rather than ask what killed this tree, they chop it up for firewood, uh, load it up in a pickup truck, and take it down to their campsite in Indiana and bring enough for the whole year. So that, that's, that's the case of the emerald ash borer. It, it essentially came in, took over, killed all our ash trees, and it's continuing across the nation and going out west. And I think I heard it was in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, not too long ago, and I'm sure it's continuing out through those areas. And people are carrying it around. Mm -hmm. By itself, naturally, it couldn't move that fast. But because people are carrying it around, and it's getting that chance to move on and, and do the damage. When Emerald Ash War was first found in Indiana, I was at the... Um Shortly thereafter, I was at the Green Expo in Indianapolis, and Cliff Sadoff was speaking. And somebody said, how long before this find in Angola gets to southern Indiana? And Cliff Sadoff's answer was eight hours in the back of a pickup truck. <laughs> and he was exactly correct. Cliff is the Purdue University entomologist yes, that handles is. those types of things. So that's, that's a good example of one that you just couldn't do. There's another one out there. Uh, that I has been in the news for some time. It's called the Asian Longhorn Beetle. Yes, and this one is is a case of your counterparts 
and the U.S. Department of Agriculture really get in on those also. I don't know if there's been one of these cited in Indiana yet, yeah. but there was over in Ohio in that Cincinnati area. Yes. And they have been very uh, vigilant about trying to clean up these uh, these Asian longhorn beetles. Our approach to Asian longhorn beetle, I should say the USDA's approach, is very similar to what they tried with uh, emerald ash borer. The first response with emerald ash borer is find a tree and cut down all the trees around it. Mm -hmm. And they were going quarter mile, half mile, but that's a very expensive way to do things. And with emerald ash borer, the problem is the half mile, quarter mile, mile wasn't far enough because by the time it, it was just so readily moved through right. firewood and other ways that it had expanded out past where we could find it. Asian longhorn beetle has a couple of different properties to it. Number one is, uh, it's a big beetle. It is huge. Um, the other difference between this one and emerald ash borer is emerald ash borer feeds in the cambial layer. Mm -hmm. So EAB will actually kill the tree by girdling the tree from the inside. If you see the bark off that tree, you just see tunnels underneath exactly. that bark all through there. Asian longhorn field or Asian longhorn beetle does feed in the cambium for a little bit, but it primarily feeds in the heartwood. So you will see a dead, well, not a dead, you'll see a maple tree with green leaves and just riddled with holes. Mm -hmm. So where you're going to find Asian longhorn beetle is typically after storm damage. Yeah. So these trees are going to break up, they're going to fall down, and that is where you start to see that, that damage. The beetle doesn't um, move quite as fast, quite yeah. as far on its own as emerald ash borer does. And its host range is, while it's wider than Asian longhorn beetle, it's not as wide as gypsy moth. Yeah. So it's primarily everything in the maple family, including box elder. It'll also feed on willows, horse chestnut. Uh, it, it's wide enough. There's about seven species it feeds on. Um, but what we find with this is we can actually scout for it. And what the USDA will do is bring in tree climbers. And they will climb up into the trees and start looking around for the exit holes, which are about the size of a number two pencil. Okay. Uh, they're, and they're perfectly round. They're not particularly... Uh, once you get attuned to them, they're pretty easy to see. So it's kind of a flag they throw up. Here I am. Yeah, and the other thing they will do is leave really fine, or really, excuse me, really coarse sawdust at the base of the tree where they push the dust out of their holes. So sometimes that in itself is a dead giveaway that that particular beetle is there. Uh, this insect was successfully eradicated in Chicago a number of years back. Okay. They've been working on it in the Cincinnati area. The, the find in Cincinnati is unique because it's the first time in a rural area that this insect has been detected. Uh, so the quarantine actually at one point grew to about 63 square miles. Yeah. Uh, but since that point in time, they've been working on it for years, and it has shrunk back quite a bit. And I've heard about it for quite some time now. Yeah. So the next one, and the one that we're seeing in the media right now, is something called Sudden Oak Death Syndrome. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that in a little bit. What, what, that sounds pretty bad. Sudden Oak Death Syndrome is also called Phytophthora remorum, and it goes by a couple other names, remorum blight. Um, uh, there's a rhododendrons are one of the most susceptible species to this particular disease. So Sudden Oak is actually... A rhododendron disease also. It Well, it actually can be carried by a lot of different uh, plants, particularly some of the things in our nursery stock. Lilacs, viburnums, um, pieris. Uh, the, the list is actually quite diverse as to what can carry it. Rhododendrons are particularly susceptible to it. Um, the oak side of things, what this disease is well known for doing is killing tan oak out in the west coast. Okay. Now interestingly, tan oak is just like mountain ash. It's not really an oak. Okay. So this gets called sudden oak death syndrome. Yes, it does affect oaks. Yes, it can kill oak trees. Uh, but the sudden oak death syndrome is actually 
referring more back to the tan oaks, okay. which it is just murder on. But this is a disease that's been known in the West Coast for a number of years. Uh, Phytotheras are not unusual. Phytothera root rots are actually very common. Got them in soybeans. Absolutely. And not uh, this not this species though. No, no. There's a lot of there's about two hundred different water molds, different phytotheras. And they get that name water mold because they they really travel under in the soils when the soils are wet and they infect during that time period. Yes. And just like all the Phytotheras, they're diseases of wet soil. Yeah. Um, Phytothera remorum, just like all the Phytothera root rots, are particularly problematic when you have wet soils, overwatering conditions, saturated pots in the nursery and trade. So, so what are you as an agency doing right now about looking for this? Because what has happened is, this disease is being brought in on nursery stock into the it's how it's being spread this is an interesting case there's for a number of years uh, probably over a decade we've done a survey for phytothera remorum and that involved going out to nurseries and just randomly sampling rhododendrons azaleas typically a few other things if we saw some symptomatic plants and sending them into purdue university the plant and pest diagnostic lab to be sampled uh, to be um, tested. Now, Purdue, using their test strips, can find out if that's Phytophthora. If it comes back Phytophthora positive, then they send it to a DNA lab in Michigan to be confirmed for remorum. So it takes a little bit of time. So one of our inspectors sampled some plant material this year and sent it in, and he wasn't particularly concerned about it, but it came back positive for Phytothera was sent in for DNA, came back positive for remorum. The Michigan lab then sent it to Beltsville, Maryland, to the USDA lab for confirmation. Okay. Uh, so it took a while to get the confirmation back, but uh, once it did, it was confirmed to be Phytothera remorum. At that point, we looked at that particular nursery, that particular stock, and said, where did this stuff come from mm -hmm. and who else got it? By the time we were done tracing things back initially, we, we thought seven states received it, but by the time the uh, USDA got involved and we traced everything back, it was 17 states received this plant material. And so by, and then really the issue is by getting these plant materials, you're spreading that disease to a location. I plant this plant under the right environmental conditions. It could get over to my oak trees and it could uh, potentially kill my oak trees down the road. Certain oak trees, not yes. every oak tree. Yes. Um, I think it's red oak, if I, if I remember right, it's worse in than white oaks. If, I uh, think you're correct. Yeah, in that situation. So that's what you're, uh, there's a lot of things in the news media about it right now that you, you really need to watch where you have purchased or look at if you, especially rhododendrons, if you have purchased some of those, then you need to keep eyes on them and make sure that they're not having some symptoms, and what kind of symptoms would I be looking at? You typically see large leaf spots okay. on the rhododendrons, uh, leaf dieback, eventually stem dieback on the plants. Uh, the basically, they just don't look good. Yeah. Uh, they just look like they're dying back yeah. when the rhododendrons get it. The leaf spots can also be present on other things like the lilacs, like the viburnums. Mm -hmm. um, they tend, those plants and most of the other hosts tend to be more carriers than actually succumbing to the disease. With this, all this plant material coming in, and, and the nursery industry is has really become a global industry. Uh, when you go into most nurseries, a very small degree of stock was actually grown in Indiana. Okay. A lot of it comes from Tennessee, Oklahoma, Washington State, yeah. Oregon, California, New Mexico, It's hard to Michigan. find a true nursery in Indiana. It is kind of hard. Yeah. And even then, the, the appetite within the landscaping industry is for more and more of these uh, exotic plants mm -hmm. or things that people think are more interesting than the natives that we, we typically have here. So we get in a lot of stuff that is of uh, European and especially Asiatic origin. Okay. Uh, that comes in for nursery stock. So plants are being propagated and moved all over the world. So the main thing, and I, I want to get across today as we talk about this uh, uh, 
um, sudden oak death syndrome. Mm -hmm. It is whether you've moved something in, like some nursery stock into your area, and if it's showing up those kind of symptoms that you were talking about, the leaf spots, the those type of things, that's what a homeowner should be looking for. Um, and it's not widespread by any means. This disease was just introduced into the state. Yeah. So to see an oak tree dying right now yeah. Yeah, would be very, very unlikely. Um, but probably the, the bigger thing, uh, there's, I think there's two real points with this disease. Number one, people ask, well, how bad is this going to be? I don't know. Yeah. Nobody does. And that's the whole thing with invasive species. You don't really know what they're going to do until they're here. And uh, I joke, um, we dealt with uh, a disease that ended up not being a big deal, thousand cankers disease right. of walnut. And I'd have guys with plant, walnut plantations ask me, and I'd joke with them, I said, well, so far nobody's donated a walnut plantation that I can infest yeah. in order to see how it acts. And, uh, you know, which is kind of a silly notion, but it really outlines the fact with these invasives, we just don't know what they're going to do until they get here. But the second thing is that really needs to be highlighted with this disease is the importance of paying attention to your plant material in your trees. Um, a lot of times, and I'm even guilty of this, I walk by the same tree every day. Do I actually look at it? Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, and the USDA and several other groups have called August Tree Check Month. And the idea is to get out and look at your trees. This was particularly started for Asian longhorn beetle. Uh, to go out and look for those holes in your trees, look for that sawdust, look for things. Uh, and there's a lot of different groups around uh, that can help if you see something or uh, something unusual on the tree and, and you're not really sure what, what you're dealing with. There's a number of folks out there that you can, uh, yourself, myself, um, uh, there, there's just a lot of folks out there. Different set of eyes. Absolutely. Uh, when I go out to somebody's place sometimes and I look at trees and I look how they're growing and what they could do pruning wise to have helped those trees a long time ago and or what they can do right now or what's going on with those different trees. It's just a different set of eyes looking at them and somebody who spends their life looking at trees is a person that would be a good thing to take a look at, uh, at your different trees and your plants around your landscape. Absolutely. The, and there's a lot of issues with um, right plant, right place and yep. a lot of there's a lot of subtleties when it comes to planting nursery stock, landscapes, and sometimes a, a little bit of professional help will go a long way. I've always seen so, it happen from from time to time. They, people love those tricolored beaches, and they plant one and it dies, and they plant another and it dies. It's just like, maybe that's not a good place to plant one of those things. Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, and, and that's what we see sometimes with a, a variety of the plants that we have in our yards. Uh, maybe that's not a good plant for that location. I have a particular plant in my yard that's been four different locations until I finally found the place it was happy. Yeah, it takes a while. Well, those are the things I wanted to cover today, Eric, and I wanted to talk about your job, talk about that the people that might be scared of what's going on with the sudden oak death syndrome and some of the other things that we've had and we've seen through the times here. I appreciate you coming today and going over those things and, and um, hopefully our audience will get an opportunity to understand some of these things and what your job is involved with. Thank you, Eric. I Thank appreciate you, it.